you know. Now, there's a lot of people today who don't believe in, in the demonic, in Satan. We, we, you, you, you see these publicly, that's unfortunate, because it is part of what the church teaches. It's the fact that there's good angels and fallen angels and Satan and, the, and hell. It's all part of the faith, de fide. As St. John Paul II said, if you don't believe in the devil, you, you don't believe in the gospel. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. Well, as always, let me start the video by saying thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. Well, in continuation with our previous video, I'm going to share a few more useful things from Father Chad Ripperger of all of you here in this video. We've heard about these exorcists talking about temptation all the time, but for me personally, this explanation provided by Father Ripperger on the relation between imagination and temptation makes it both clear and scary. Scary in the sense that Father Ripperger's explanation is helpful in explaining the process of these demons tempting us through our imagination. And looking back at the various times I've had to deal with temptations in my own life, well, I think or I hope that this will be helpful for you too. Well, demons have access to our bodies, and part of our body is the brain. And the brain actually performs a variety of different functions. It's the material side of the intellect. And part of that is the imagination. And also what St. Thomas calls the cogitative power. It's the part of the brain that has the ability to make associations. So once something comes into the imagination through our senses, then the cogitative power makes certain associations in relationship to that. The part of the, there's also a part of the brain that does interpretation in relationship to emotions. That's also part of the cogitative power in the Thomistic sense. And then we have an emotional response. But because the emotions are the physical, they, that is the soul acting through the body has its emotions, then in that particular uh, motion, it, because it's physical, demons can actually influence it. They can increase it. They can block it. They can actually cause emotions without the person having anything even in their imagination. In certain cases, you see that with people who are possessed. And so very often what they'll do is they'll uh, put something in the imagination. They'll put a perspective on that. And then the emotions are moved by what's in the imagination. And so then the person will have an, a specific emotional response. So demons can move the emotions by the perspective they put on our image and our imagination, what we're thinking about, and then they can move the emotions. Now, sometimes they just do one or the other. Uh, they rarely do the moving the emotions without something in the imagination, but that does happen with people who have diabolic obsession or who are possessed. But in normal temptation, they normally don't really do that. What they usually do is put something in the imagination, and then they'll try and drive the emotions in relationship to it. The point being is, is we can't know anything, St. Thomas Aquinas says, in this life without the imagination. So even when the immaterial part of our intellect, um, which he calls the possible intellect, which has the ability for self-reflection and judgment and things of that sort, we can't do those things without the imagination. Because it depends on the imagination, both for its content, which it extracts into concepts, which the ancient intellect does, and then it also needs it to make judgments. That is, we convert back to the image in our imagination in order to make judgments. So if I want to know that all dogs are four-footed, I have to look at the image of my imagination to, to imagine dogs, uh, and I can't imagine any dogs that aren't four-footed, unless, of course, they've lost them unnaturally. So I have to, uh, I have to look at the image in my imagination. So demons control the information by affecting the image or trying to control our images in our imagination. This is done through ordinary temptation. Every human being has experienced it. They will simply put something, in, put a perspective on the image in the imagination and then, uh, or they'll affect the imagination. Um, and that's just ordinary temptation. But they can also, when a person reads things or looks at certain things, they can put a commentary, that is, they can put his perspective on it to affect the person's input of information. In more extreme cases of obsession, possession, and oppression, they will actually block the person from coming to knowledge about the truth. And the reason being is, is because once the person recognizes 
the truth of a situation, the demons hold, because demons, their hold on us is in large part in connected to error. That is, we have an erroneous understanding of something, and once we come to the truth and the knowledge of that, then we are freed from their grip. And so this means that the demons want to control what people know in order to control their behavior. Um, this they only want to allow information which promotes their viewpoint. They manipulate the images and the talking points that we experience. And here Father Ripperger further explains on how these demons attack the imagination more specifically. Demons psychologically harangue the person and do running commentary. What does that mean? It means that they will constantly put in someone's mind a particular perspective or something in relationship to the thing that the person's thinking about. For example, a wife might have actually a pretty decent husband, but he will constantly put in her mind a perspective that he doesn't love her or whatever he is doing is bad or whatever the case is. So there's this constant running commentary. Anything that comes into the person's senses that is contrary to what the demons want the person to believe it's immediately affected in the image. In other words, they just constantly manipulate the person's viewpoint on things. They seek not to allow the person to have the freedom of thought, but to think only what they suggest. That's the goal, to get to the person, get the person to sign off on the patterns of thinking that they want to form or shape in the individual. God permitting, they are able to launch any form of attack against the person intellectually. But if the person tries to refute it, in other words, very often a person realizes there's something wrong with the way this, I'm seeing this, they will manipulate his thinking process so that he doesn't have the ability to climb out of that pattern of thinking. In other words, if he tries to reason his way out, the demons have already gained control or certain influence over the imagination and what's in there. And so anytime the individual tries to think of something else, they will simply, as part of the running commentary, shift the view so that the person can never seem to kind of climb out of this obsession or this viewpoint. They accuse the person of everything under the sun and retaliate emotionally if the person does not accept what they want in their imagination. Otherwise, if the person tries to fight it or reject it, then they will retaliate against the individual for doing so. Demons, when you counter them, they fight all the more. In other words, the more you try and shut them down, the more they tend to fight by trying to affect their imagination. Demons expect you to take their abuse and if you don't, they are very vindictive. So the only way to ultimately shut that process down is to simply ignore them. Stop thinking about the thing that they're trying to, to put in your mind. Get your mind cleared. And then later you'll see that the reality of the situation. The journey of spiritual combat begins with arming ourselves with the powerful disciplines of fasting and almsgiving. Both practices have been observed by Christians since ancient times, serving as transformative tools in our spiritual growth. Fasting is a way of imitating Christ's 40-day fast in the wilderness, where he faced the devil's temptations and emerged victorious. By partaking in fasting, we not only follow Christ's example, but also attain a deeper purity of heart. Fasting involves restraining not only our bodies through abstinence from food and drink, but also our souls through the suppression of passions and desires. Almsgiving, inextricably linked with fasting, embodies the essence of love for our neighbor, reflecting the very nature of God's mercy. The act of giving selflessly to those in need shows our humility and reminds us of God's grace in our lives. St. John Chrysostom profoundly encourages us to extend our fasting beyond food and drinks, prompting us to fast from slander, gossip, and any form of harm toward others. By embracing both fasting and almsgiving, we equip ourselves with the strength to overcome the spiritual battles that come our way. Anyway, there's a conversation between Father Vincent Lampert and Subdeacon Daniel Kakish that I'd like to share with you regarding the Lord of the Flies. Now, just as a brief introduction, Daniel Kakish is a subdeacon in the Syriac Orthodox Church. Uh, very, and it's it's obvious, like uh, the intercession of Mary and the saints. It's um, like I don't know if there is. It's like a 
a, a dream team that were asking <laughs> to help us, you know. <laughs> of course, it's going to be powerful. Uh, so it's it's awesome that God gave us these tools in his church that it's like he gives us everything that's necessary in order to help us in, in all of these things that, that we face. Um, he doesn't leave us alone. They, in the word you said it could be translated to, to demons. Yes, you're right. It, mm -hmm. the, the word actually in Syriac that you will see a lot for the devil, or it's uh, the same word that they transliterated in the gospel Beelzebub. By mm -hmm. the so our, and it literally, it means the enemies. Or oh. actually, sorry, no. We use it to mean the enemies. Literally, it means the Lord of the flies. Yes. That's what it literally oh. means. We use it to mean our enemies or demons, and it could be meaning a lot of things. Like literally, you're in a war against the enemy, you will use that word. But it means Lord of the flies. Ba'al means Lord. The Bobain, the Baba means flies or flies. So, um, and still till today in colloquial Syriac, when they speak, when they're talking about flies, they use that word, didwa. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, it's an interesting word to use about them. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure the cor correlation, bail, ba'al, flies. I don't know the con connection that ha that has with the devil, but it happened. So, that's the, that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I would comment on that because, you know, where do you see flies around the dead? Mm. And it was the temptation of mm. Satan that brought death into the world. He says to Eve, surely you will not die. You will become like God. Mm. But then he, he shows his true character. You know, the devil is called the, a liar from the very beginning, the father of all lies, because his lie is what brought death into the world. So... The reference to the devil, Satan, as Beelzebul, the Lord of the Flies, is because he's Lord of Death. Mm, that makes sense. Okay. And lastly, I'd like to share something from one of my favorite exorcists that speak about the subject of spiritual warfare, Monsignor Stephen Rossetti. We experience in the sessions. Throw some holy water, hold up a crucifix, call on the Blessed Mother, have the person go to confession, do sacramentals, communion of saints, all these things. It's all true. It's all true. The Catholic Church, everything it teaches is true, and we experience it, and so it's a real confirmation. Another thing we experience, which is why I sleep very well at night, people say, oh my gosh, if I can't read your book, I won't be able to sleep at night. I say, well, that's not my goal. Uh, I sleep very well at night. Now, do, do we get attacked by demons? Of course we do. I mean, it, it, you can't keep poking Satan in the eye and not think he's going to come back at you. You know, be just some exorcist said, I thought we were protected. I said, yeah, you're protected. We trained exorcists. Yeah. I said, but don't keep poking him in the eye and wonder why he's a little upset about it. You're going you're gonna to get a response. But Jesus will protect you. Our Blessed Mother will protect you. Demons are boring. It's the same old message all the time. They're boring. Don't go to hell. Besides all the nasty things that happen there, they're boring. The hell's boring. You know, it's just evil is boring. Satan tries to make you think that it's really exciting, you know. It's boring. Demons are boring. Is the best it got? Well, then that is all for the video this time. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us, and I hope you've learned a lot from this video. If there's any feedback or suggestion, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments below. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your continuous support, prayer, and contribution. It is because of you that I am able to do this full time. Well then, until the next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you. Paradise is you're going to be with God, Father, Son, and Spirit, in their presence forever face to face. But listen to what I'm saying to you again. To again. In okay. our paradise, there's no sex. Jesus said in Luke 20, 34 to 36, Luke 20, 34 to 36, you will not have sex and be married in heaven. You'll be like okay. angels. You won't have sex. Luke chapter 20. Verses 34 to 36. So the greatest pleasure, the greatest joy and peace is to see Jesus face to face, see the Father appear visibly, filled with the Holy Spirit in their presence forever. That's true paradise for Christians. Oh. Okay. So write down the verses and read them. Read them when you have a chance. You wrote down John 14 verses 1 to 6, right? John 17, 24. Right. Did you write it? 
John 17, 24. Then write Luke 20, 34 to 36. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. Okay. Then write, finally, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 7. And the final statement, what I want to make okay, is, go ahead. Amazing, is why it's hard for me, yes. you know, to leave my faith because I Allah promises in the Quran, I am truth, I am truth. Yeah. And for, for the good doers, it's paradise. Okay, so and when Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am life itself. No one comes to the Father except through me. Allah is not the yeah. Father. Jesus is not a son. Jesus says, I'm the truth, which means Allah lied to you when he said he's the yeah. truth. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, but, but you're not, no, no, you're not understanding. Shut up. Let's try it again. If Jesus says he's the truth, Allah says he's the truth. And Jesus says, I'm the truth and God is my father and I'm the son of God. But Allah says he's not the father of Jesus. That means one of them is lying. They can't both be the truth. That's why I'm saying I understand it contradicts totally. I cannot find so, similar thing. I know Jesus says I'm the okay, first. Okay, so that's alive. why, Shah, Shah, I got ended here. I follow Jesus because he's alive. He left the tomb empty. He's not dead. Muhammad died. So you can take the word of a dead man. I'll take the word of the one who's alive. And even you as okay. a Muslim, you believe Sam, Isa is alive. Muhammad is dead. End of story. Uh, we got to go. Sam, listen. Yes. When Jesus will come back, right? Why will he come back? That's even, you should ask, why don't your prophet come back? Why is Jesus coming back? Thank you for proving Muhammad is a liar. Thank you.